Michael Payne. Uh, Michael Payne is uh, one of the leading uh, sports manager of uh, of the world. Uh, he's the first ever and former IOC marketing director. I will see this is International Olympic Committee. After that, he was uh, the advisor to Bernie Eccleston, the head of Formula One. Michael set up all the huge uh, and the most influential, influential and powerful program inside the IOC, which uh, uh, strength, strengthened the IOC and uh, turned the IOC to... Uh, <laughs> A well-known organization uh, in the world and uh, we would like to hear Michael uh, very carefully and after the lecture of Michael we uh, it, it would be also the possibility to uh, uh, to ask some questions to Michael okay uh, hi Dar uh, thank you is it over to me Can you hear me, Ida, clearly? Yeah, yeah, I hear you very, very well, yeah. All right. Okay, well, listen, thank you for uh, that kind introduction. Um, uh, I'm greeting you from uh, the mountains in Switzerland, where uh, I am currently high up in, in the mountains. Um, um, but I've had many, many great trips and visits to Kazakhstan over the years, uh, many great memories. Uh, Maybe uh, next time I come to your great country, we can do uh, a lecture or some form in person. Um, but very happy to to talk uh, to you today. Um, just a little bit about the the business of sport um, and maybe the role of public relations uh, and marketing within sport. Um, as Ida kind of mentioned, I you know have spent the, much of my career uh, with the Olympic Games. Uh, I next summer Paris will be my twenty second Olympic Games. Uh, I should hasten to add that is winter and summer games. Um, otherwise, I would be even older than I currently look. <laughs> um, I actually got involved with the sports business back in the 1970s uh, at the very beginning of the industry. Uh, and I was um, actually a, a professional ski racer. Uh, in order to compete on the ski circuit, I had to find sponsors. Uh, it was the very beginning of the industry in terms of finding sponsors. And uh, I soon realized that I was a lot better at finding sponsors than I was at winning any of the competitions. Um, so I, I made a career change and decided that I should uh, uh, try and understand how this new business of sports management, sports marketing was working. Uh, and over the next um, 45 years, um, I've been at the forefront uh, of the sports marketing business. Um, uh, at the Olympic Games, um, I'd I mentioned the, the top program. Um, that's the IOC's sponsorship partnership program, uh, which we launched in the mid-1980s. And maybe just to give some perspective as to how the industry has evolved and changed. When I was first selling the sponsorship, we were very grateful if we could close a partnership deal for $10 million. At the time, was seen as a lot of money. Today, uh, where I'm still working for the IOC, um, we're looking at closing deals in excess of a billion dollars. So that's gone from 10 million to 1 billion in under four decades. Um, 
it's funny when you look at the IOC today, everybody thinks, you know, there's the you know, the billions of dollars involved, all the cities trying to sort of compete to host the Olympic Games. But when I joined the IOC, the, the organization was nearly bankrupt. Uh, there was no money in the bank. Uh, you couldn't give the Olympic Games away. You know, interestingly, you, know, you go back to the 1984 Los Angeles Olympic Games, um, which were very successful. But when they were bidding, uh, initially there were two candidates. Then one of the candidates, which was Iran, they were putting forward the city of Tehran, withdrew because mm -hmm. the the Ayatollahs didn't think it was maybe a good idea to invite the world to their country and have a party. And Los Angeles also wanted to withdraw because they couldn't work out the financial model. Uh, and so back in the early 80s, we had no candidates for the Olympic Games. We had no money. And if you could, by some miracle, persuade a city to stage the games, odds on the geopolitical superpowers of the day would suddenly go boycott and the Olympics was caught as a pawn between the sort of geopolitics, the Cold War of the day. Um, you fast forward now and you have the greatest cities of the world staging the games. You have uh, very strong marketing and, and very strong media programs. And my uh, two decades of the IOC as the director was really uh, designed to try and uh, lead what was in effect a business turnaround from bankruptcy to uh, startup. And I think Ida knows I wrote a book uh, on the subject called Olympic Turnaround. Uh, it was published many years ago, uh, but <laughs> and it tells the business story. Uh, you can find it online. Um, and anybody who is studying the sports business um, may find it quite interesting. Uh, many of the lessons and observations that I make in there are still very, very true today. Um, after uh, I stood down from the Olympics, I uh, joined Formula One, Bernie Eccleston, uh, to help him with the business development of Formula One uh, and stayed there for maybe 15 years uh, until we sold Formula One to the American venture group, Liberty. Um, but I stayed advising the IOC, uh, advising the cities on how to get the games. Uh, and I also uh, joined the boards or advisory to a broad section of different sports. Um, everything from... Uh, golf and the Ryder Cup uh, to volleyball and the whole new joint venture capital partnership with CVC. Uh, through most recently, and as a strange one, uh, the sport of modern pentathlon, which was thrown off the Olympic program. This was the original Olympic sport, but you know, was just no longer delivering any TV audiences, any digital audiences. Uh, and the IOC said, look, we're terribly sorry, but if you can't completely reform, you are off the Olympic program, which would have meant the sport was dead. Um, and I was asked if I could have a look at it and help. Uh, and we completely radically changed the sport um, by dropping a question and replacing them with Ninja Warriors, the obstacle course. And a month ago, the IOC welcomed Modern Pentathlon back onto the Olympic program. Um, so I've had a, we say a fairly broad exposure to the, uh, the whole breadth of different sports. 
looking at their business model, their entertainment model, um, their partnership model, their television model, um, and really what I was going to sort of spend a few minutes on now is just looking a little bit at some of the the key PR issues that are related to those different sectors on the sport. Um, yeah, I think you can sort of break the role of public relations down into the following areas. One is bidding for events. When countries or cities want to go and attract an event to come to their country. Uh, and public relations there plays a critical role in telling the story about why city A should be chosen over city B. Um, and to give a couple of examples, uh, I was the senior advisor uh, for the London Games. London was my home city. Um, but London was up against the favorite Paris. Um, and we developed a PR strategy, a communication strategy for London that ultimately ensured that London won and beat Paris because Paris was just talking about having great sports events, great, 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 great sports facilities. Uh, and frankly, all of the cities bidding for the games have great sports facilities. And I advocated to the London organizers that we needed to say something more. We needed a bigger picture. We needed a bigger vision. And we came up with the idea of how do you use the Olympic Games as an inspiration for the youth, as a catalyst for bringing young people into sport. And in the end, that messaging, that positioning uh, helped London to beat Paris. Um, but once you've got the event, uh, the journey then is only beginning. And a lot of organizers, a lot of host countries and cities get so wrapped up on the technical aspects of delivering the event, the operations. How does the transport work? How does the security work? That they don't pay any attention to looking at what is the return mm -hmm. on the investment for them in hosting the event. What do they want to get out of it? And often only very late in the day does the government or city officials wake up to the potential, you know, the ROI. Uh, and you can look at a couple of interesting examples here. Um, one of the first games I was involved with was the 1988 games in Korea, in Seoul. And there is a defining moment in Korea's image between before the games and after the games. Before the games, made in Korea, Seoul was a very cheap, down market, lack of quality, copy image. After the games, it transformed the image of the country into the whole question of innovation, technology leadership. Um, and it's very interesting when you go back and look at that whole perspective and journey. Uh, you have in Formula One, I took Formula One to Singapore and their night race because Singapore was concerned they were you, be viewed as a maybe stayed, somewhat conservative, quiet, reserved country. And they wanted to sex it up a little bit. And the idea of having a street night race created, helped create a whole new positive identity and image for 
Singapore. So you have a very important role in public relations uh, for the whole question of hosting of events. Um, most recently, you would have seen the Qatar World Cup, uh, where before the World Cup, you know, people knew very little, if anything, about Qatar. Uh, it was a difficult journey getting there, particularly from a public relations standpoint, because uh, the Arab nation, if you want, struggled with their messaging and their position. But finally, it was a great event and reflected very positively on the country uh, and in many ways the whole region. Uh, I think there is no way that Saudi Arabia would now be positioned as the host for the 2032 World Cup if it hadn't been for the success of Qatar. You move on on PR to the area of sponsors and clearly you know, the public relations is a very important pillar on how sponsors deliver their return on their investment. Um, yeah. the, the PR allows you to tell a story. Great advertising, you can't always easily tell a story and have it clearly validated. Uh, at the moment, I'm you know, working with Alibaba and looking at the role of AI and the complete digital transformation of the Olympics and how by 2028, the Los Angeles Games will be very much these uh, AI Olympic Games. Um, moving on from sponsors, uh, you have the whole question of crises management. Every organization, every company uh, can suddenly face an unexpected crisis. And here, you know, the public relations plays a critical role in helping to communicate and manage and engage and influence public opinion. Um, I lived a crisis at the IOC, at the Olympics, uh, known as the Salt Lake corruption scandal, because it was found out that after Salt Lake had won the right to host the Olympic Games, uh, should we say they had used um, excessive influence and gifts in order to attract the votes. And here was a crisis that very nearly collapsed the IOC. Uh, I would go into the office each morning and at the peak of the media feeding frenzy, not know if the organization would survive the day. Of course, in the end, we did survive. But more importantly, and the advice that I was given by many uh, very important chief executives at the time was every organization faces a crisis. The challenge and the opportunity is how do you turn that crisis round to be a catalyst for change? How do you use that? How do you use that crisis to your own advantage? And in the case of the Olympics, once we got some control over what was happening, we then pushed through thirty years or a, a reform program that would normally have taken 30 years, we pushed through in six months. Mm -hmm. um, and that is often the case, that the crisis becomes a catalyst to facilitating and driving change. Um, that probably you know, prompts me just to make a few remarks about you know, the rules of media engagement. Uh, and I, you know, identified six rules. One, communicate. Communicate, communicate, communicate. All too often, particularly in a crisis, somebody goes into their shell and hides. That will only make the situation worse. Secondly, 
you've got to invest. And I'm not talking necessarily here about money. I'm talking about time and effort that you have to invest in building the relationships with the media, with the journalists, so that when there is an issue, when there is a problem, you are not on the back foot trying to catch up. You already have a basis to be able to talk, to explain. Uh, they understand you. And I spent at the IOC a lot of time investing my time in building up rapport and relationship with the key business journalists at the Financial Times, at the Wall Street Journal, at Bloomberg. Because when there was an issue, at least they would then call me up and say, Michael, what's happening? But if there was no relationship there, they wouldn't call and they would just write their article or they would call somebody else who didn't know what was happening. And suddenly you find media articles that are not exactly putting across your story. So invest in the relationships with the, the key media and build those relationships. Uh, also, you have to make sure that you have a single voice. That doesn't mean just one person speaking, but that there is a single clear message. Because if you're sending out contradictory messages, the media will be all over it, and it will you, you will not be able to get your story through. Worse, you'll probably find that your story has been misunderstood, misconstrued, or twisted around. The mm -hmm. last point is the question of speed. I think looking at the way that media is structured today, <laughs> in particular social media, how the issue of fake news, of rumors, of uh, undue influence peddling, you have to be so fast, so quick to correct what is not right and to make sure you are out there leading the narrative as opposed to responding to the narrative. Um, and that's only going to get ever more complicated. Uh, and as such, you know, the, the, the PR role will become ever more critical because you could spend 50 years or 100 years building up a reputation, building up a brand. You could lose it in an hour. Yeah. And then to rebuild it will take a lot of time, it's a lot of money. Uh, so those will be just some of my sort of observations on rules of engagement. Um, let me just sort of close before we open up to questions, just some remarks about the future. Um, sport is only going to become more important to society because people are looking for entertainment, whether it's to watch whether it's to engage in, whether it's to participate, whether it's to exchange views on social uh, sports is perhaps the, the, the single most important medium, more important than music, more important than politics in terms of engaging a connection with you know, the public, within family, within friends, whether it's actively participating or passively watching. Uh, now, some sports may disappear. Modern pentathlon came that close to disappearing, and they would already be in the museum if we hadn't made the changes that we did. Other sports are exploding, football. You look at F1 last weekend in Las Vegas, and you can get into a discussion of what's sport, what's entertainment. Sometimes the 
the bar may go too far one way or the other. But sport is only going to come more important. It will continue to influence and drive the media landscape, uh, allow new media and platforms to step up and gain the fan base, the following that is needed. Um, and it will play an increasing role on how companies build their loyalty, showcase their innovation, showcase their technology. But the traditional model of sponsorship is changing radically. You know, the days where you would just stick your name on the side of a stadium, on the badge, on the athlete, and wait for you know, the exposure, that can still be, you know, still be relevant. But that is only a small part of how companies today are looking to engage and, and develop their, their marketing strategies. Um, I don't, I don't want to keep talking because I think it's going to be much more helpful to you and your colleagues, you know, if you want to start asking yeah. <clears throat> questions that yeah. are, you know, most relevant to what you're thinking, what you're studying, how, you know, you're seeing. So wh why don't we, you know, move more to a and a Okay. Thank you, Michael, for a very interesting <clears throat> speech. Because uh, it was always pre big, so huge pleasure for me working with you. I think this year would be ah, this year already ten years since we know each other, since Sport Accord in Saint Petersburg. Uh, I just wanted to uh, raise the question about this top program. I just wanted uh, to draw the attention of my students uh, how, by examples, for example, yeah, uh, yeah, we, we all. Some of us, not all of us, but some of us know that uh, the mi middle eighties IOC uh, was uh, almost bankruptcy. And then you just uh, set up this uh, first the program with TV rights and so on, and then uh, this top program. Uh, could you just uh, show us uh, some examples how you convinced the top management of this of Coke for for Coca Cola, for example? or some uh, other McDonald's or ABC, NBC uh, to uh, sign this long year's contract for the huge sums, for the huge amounts of money. Uh, how you convince them uh, to, do, to do that? Although to that time, they also already known by themselves that IOC isn't so really a high level organization in their eyes. And was in crisis. There were two boycotts of two Olympics in Moscow, 1980, and then the Los Angeles, 1984. How you convinced the top management of the of the huge companies just to join this program, just to work with with IOC together? Um. Yeah. First of all, maybe to explain what the top program is and why we started it. Uh. In the early 80s, yes, the IOC was nearly bankrupt, and the only revenue source was from television rights, and 95% of that revenue came from America, and it's never a good strategy to have all of your revenue coming from a single source particularly when that single source is America and the politicians start thinking of changing the legislation so that the American committee keeps all the money and the IOC receives nothing. So one of the first moves that Samaranj, when he became president, said is you have to diversify the revenue. We need to create a second line of income and that was decided to be sponsorship we had the olympic games the event we had the five ring symbol which arguably is one of if not the most recognized symbols in the world 
but the legal constitution said that each country had the approval right over the Olympic symbol usage in their country. So even if we wanted to develop a worldwide program, we couldn't because we had no territory. So the top program was eventually designed to include the IOC, the Summer Games, the Winter Games, and each of the, at time, 168 countries. Now it is 220 national Olympic committees. And if you thought that negotiating with the companies was complicated, that was the easy part. Getting 170 countries to agree to a single marketing strategy was nigh on impossible. And just to give some context here, um, the American Olympic Committee would say, so you're going to go and find companies, sponsors like Coca-Cola and Kodak? Said, yes. Yes. And you're then going to distribute that money the channel, around the world? Yes. But these are American companies. So, no, no, they're worldwide companies. But you're then going to go and take the American money and you're going to give it to the Soviets. You're going to give it to the communists so that they can take our gold medals. Or in the discussions with the Soviet Olympic Committee, they would say, hang on, you're going to bring more money into this. Well, so we're going to have to increase how much the government is spending in order to stay competitive. So you were caught absolutely center in the middle of the Cold War politics. And it was perhaps the biggest single achievement of the top program was getting the 170 countries all to agree to a single marketing strategy because nobody else had ever done that. The UN, nobody had ever got all countries to agree to a single vision. But then we also in parallel had to convince the companies. And interestingly, it was a couple of companies who had no involvement in sport no history of any sponsorship whatsoever who transformed the idea of sponsorship. Because sponsorship, Coca-Cola, Kodak, it was all about sticking your name on the side of the pitch. It was never about really integrating the sport asset into the core of your marketing. It was an afterthought. But we approached American Express and said, we'd like to do a worldwide program. And American Express said, ah, we're not interested. We only want the top 10 markets. And we don't believe in a worldwide program. And there's nobody else who will do it in our category. And we said, well, if you'll forgive us, we're going to try and develop a worldwide program. And fortuitously, we then went to Visa. And Visa corporate structure, it was owned by 16,000 different banks. And they had never had a single marketing program or strategy. But they just hired a new chief marketing officer who was looking at all of their research and said, we have a problem. We are the most widely accepted credit card in the world. We're the most used. But whenever it comes to business traveling expenses, people only use their American Express card. That was the image. That was the perception. What if we became a sponsor of the Olympic Games? and ran an advertising campaign which said, if you're going to the Olympic Games this year, 
don't forget to take your visa card because the Olympic Games doesn't take American Express. And suddenly, mm. how is this possible? The world's largest event doesn't take American Express. Whether you were going to the Games or not, the messaging here was so strong and Visa wasn't cared about logos or whatever. They wanted to take this message and totally integrate it into all of their marketing and advertising. The results gave billions, billions of dollars within a couple of years to Visa. And 40 years on, Visa is still a sponsor of the Olympics. Two years into their sponsorship, I received the call from the chief executive of American Express. Say, Michael, sorry I turned you down. I now would like to come in. I offer however much money you want to switch to American Express. And we said, look, we're sorry. I mean, you turned us down. We're sticking with Visa. And the CEO of American Express, James Robinson, uh, went on to say that, it, that turning the Olympics down was the single greatest professional mistake of his career. But the, the point here was Visa approached this <clears throat> with understanding how to use the power of the Olympics and put it at the service of their brand, their strategic thinking. And <clears throat> time and again, we then had stories. When I did the original deal with Samsung for mobile phones, Samsung's ranking on the global interbrand list was around 98. Their role in the mobile phone category was barely in the top 10. Within four years, with all of their marketing being tied to the Olympics, all of it, they had jumped from 98 to 20 on the global brand listing. And they were now the second largest and most successful phone company in the world. Now, obviously, they had to have the product. The phones had to work and the innovation and the engineering. But in terms of their image, their branding, their positioning, their market share, the Olympics became the catalyst. Lego Ida are two different examples. Yeah, it's brilliant, brilliant examples. Yeah. So I, I remember now that about this topic about American Express. I read it in your uh, brilliant book. One question more. I recently had a uh, conversation with one guy originally from Azerbaijan. He is now living in the U.S. And uh, we just talked about uh, staging Formula One in Baku in Azerbaijan. So uh, I know that I think this story is something like seven, eight years uh, old. And uh, even 10 years ago, there were also some uh, rumors here just to bring Formula One to Asana. Uh, like for Grand Prix Kazakhstan or Grand Prix of Asana or something like that. But uh, some of our guys, especially uh, on the level of government, just told, well, look, it would be a huge amount of money. It would be just wasting of our money and so on. But when I now remember this uh, talk with uh, this Azerbaijani guy, Azerbaijani manager, he talked, look, uh, I think we uh, got the revenue, which is now uh, much, much higher than the money uh, we spent for the staging of this uh, Formula One in Baku. There are some, the, the, the whole world is coming to Baku on that days. Uh, this is uh, the, the week uh, of the race. There are so many uh, people from around the world who are coming to Baku, to Azerbaijan, who are just exploring the country for themselves. Uh, I just, the question is, uh, look, uh, to, to stage, some uh, Formula One race, uh, it's not only the big amount of spending of big amount of money, but could also bring the revenue, uh, not only in fin financial form, which is, uh, of course, very important uh, to the country, but also just uh, 
um, uh, putting the name of the country on the world's map again, especially for such people who are uh, still uh, thinking that Kazakhstan is just the part of Russia or something like that, or somewhere in Eurasia. Uh, what is your meaning uh, to stage Formula One race? Is most bringing to the country only the positive story, bringing the country the positive PR, or it could be also bringing some some negative points. What 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 is well, your meaning? Whether you're talking of Formula One or or many other potential events or whatever, I think it is completely wrong to believe that you can amortize the cost of that event over a weekend or over the month of the tournament. So when Formula One goes to a location, the organizers get the ticketing revenue, but you're not gonna that's not gonna cover the cost. The organizers or the city will get the benefit of tourists coming in. Some events attract more tourists than others. The hotel rates, the hotels are full. And all of that is useful. But that is, in my view, a only a small part of the potential return. In the case of Formula One, you are part of a journey every year for nine months twinned with 20 or 22 other cities with all of the world's media week in week out talking about formula one talking about the different races on the circuit when they come to the town they don't just focus on the race they talk about the culture, the history, the whole experience of being in the country. The branding and image value of that is, you know, is priceless. And over a period of time, you are able, through the staging of the big events, you are able to change the image and reputation and understanding of the country. And if you turn around and said to the political leaders, look, if I could increase your annual tourism, not for a weekend, but year in, year out, if I could increase it by 10%, if I could change the image of made in Kazakhstan, what does that mean today versus something that is about innovation, about design, about the whole storytelling? If I could do all of that, how much would you pay me? You know, the, the, the government ministry might be very happy to go and spend $50 million on an advertising campaign around the world, and it will get some results. But the staging of a big event um, with the right strategic vision and I would say less than 50% of the countries and organizers staging an event have the right strategic vision. The, the returns are, there's no question. You look at it and you say, well, why didn't I do this sooner? Why didn't I do it earlier? I mean, and you know, look at what's happening now to your neighbor you know, in Saudi Arabia. And look at how they are embracing sport as a catalyst to transform and change the image of the country. Who else wants to ask questions, Aida? Good. Good, yeah. I think... Uh... Okay. Can some? I think can I, uh, somebody can I ask question? Can, can ask the questions. Yeah. Yes. I want to ask Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mr. Payne, thank you so much. That was a very, very in insightful uh, lecture from your side. We know you as a legend of sports marketing. 
You've talked a lot about the history. What about the future? How do you see the future of sports marketing? All these artificial intelligence, all these buzzwords. What's in your opinion? What's what's going to be the impact of all this technology to the sports overall and the sports marketing per se? Thank you. Um. Well, we're always living in exciting times, and I think at the moment we're living in exceedingly exciting times. Um, and times also of potentially great change. Uh, first of all, if you look at sports relationship with the the fan, the consumer, traditionally, that relationship has been driven through the medium of television. And that's how the vast majority of people have been able to get their consumption of the sport. Um, and the medium of television hasn't fundamentally changed as a delivery mechanism in 50 years. Yes, you've gone from black and white to color. You've gone to stereo sound you've gone from big cameras to little cameras to take you closer to the action but the actual medium for delivering has been primarily the tv network now you're moving into um the whole area of streaming the ability to customize your choice the ability to follow just your team or club. So the fan has much more choice. The network is struggling. And often for the network, the only way they are still getting a big audience is through a live sport event. And that's why they're trying to hang on to the live event. But if you go forward 10 years from now and the IOC having to look at, well, what are its new television contracts for, the, for 2030, 2032? <clears throat> there is nobody out there in the world today that is able to tell you what the medium of television is going to look like and how it's going to work. Nobody can tell you. And, you know, the IOC is out, out going around California, meeting Tim Cook at Apple and all of the different leaders. Nobody knows. So what you can say is sport's going to be very important. But who is going to be delivering it to the fan? We don't know. When you look at technology and how it is going to be produced, I'll give an interesting example we worked with on Alibaba and the Olympics. To produce the Olympics requires a massive um, production operation where you have to send all the engineers and the graphic designers and the commentators and everybody to the games. Suddenly, along comes COVID, and it was difficult to travel. For the Tokyo Games, we wanted to do a test of how much of the broadcast could be produced on the cloud. Did we have to take everybody to the host country, or could some of the production still be produced back in, back in Astana, back in London, on the cloud? And we thought maybe 2% test. Because of COVID, we did 30% of the production on the cloud. And by Paris next year, I think it may be even be 60%. Because you no longer had to send everybody to the games, which had dramatic impact on costs, on logistics. Now let's look at AI. The whole issue of AI, large language models, chat GPT, 
they are talking that by the end of the century, there'll be no TV commentators. The whole thing will get driven by AI and large language models. Now, I think that's a bit extreme, and the lead commentators and everything will still be playing a major role. But they're also talking about no longer having any judges or officials. The whole thing will be AI computerized. And to be honest, when you're looking at certain sports, we say like diving, yeah, the human can't compete with how technology can now far more accurately, far more fairly judge. You look in football and FIFA and, and everything and the role of VAR, the, the video automated referee. And mm -hmm. all of these areas of technology will play an ever more important role to improve the sporting experience, to improve how you can engage with it, how you can participate. Um, and as such, it's a very exciting time, but uh, a time where there's a lot of unanswered questions at the moment. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I didn't know Marawa just wanted to raise the question, right? What? Adina Omarova? Or not anymore? Okay. Who uh, who would like to ask the, 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 uh, the next questions? I Please. wanted to ask a question. Uh -huh, okay. Uh, should a country invest in the Olympic Games to be able to represent the Olympic Games in the country? How, for example, Qatar invested in FIFA to host a football championship there? When you say invest, you mean to host the games or to send a very strong team to the games? Uh, to um, host, I think. Yes, to host a football championship or uh, any other like Olympic championship. For example, if Imagine uh, like uh, Kazakhstan want to uh, host uh, um, Olympic Games in our country. So not only by building uh, a big centers for people, but should also country invest in the Olympic Games to uh, provide the games? Well, um, your country came very, very close to winning the right to host the 22 Winter Olympic Games in Almaty. Uh, I think you probably came much closer than anybody ever realized. Because when the final vote was taken, at that stage, there were only two candidates left. One was Beijing and the other was Almaty. And let's just say I know on very good authority that Beijing, when they originally decided to bid for the Winter Olympic Games, had no expectation to win. For them, it was a longer term plan to develop winter sports and their real agenda was to host the Winter Games in 26 or 2030. I think Almaty had put forward a candidature, but nobody was ever really sure that you could be successful. And so, you know, a lot of leaders not wanting to embarrassed themselves by losing, sat on the fence. And very, very late in the day that they suddenly realized, actually, technically, we maybe have a better bid here than Beijing at the time, because you had a lot of great infrastructure in place in Almaty. 
And again, very late in the day, you started to develop a strong bid campaign. That, when it finally came to the vote, for the first time in voting history, the voting machine broke down. Well, that's what everybody was told because everybody was told there was a problem and they had to go and vote again. My read of the situation was that the vote was probably a draw and the president didn't want to have the responsibility to break to break the draw. Um, and so he asked everybody to vote again. So I think you came much closer to hosting the games than a lot of people realize. And you know, the starting point is, do you have a basic infrastructure? In Almaty, I think, yes. And, I, and for the winter games in Almaty, do. Yeah. Then, I mean, look at, look at the cost, for example. How much did you invest in Expo? And what was the benefit of all of that? It certainly potentially was opened up a new development area in Astana, but nobody around the world knew that Kazakhstan was hosting Expo. Uh, you know, the one thing you can say if you're hosting the Olympic Games, everybody knows, everybody watches. And you have a platform to tell your story in the way that Korea told its story, in the way that China told its story. You know, Japan, back to the 1964 Olympics, it was a turning point for the country to step out onto the world stage. So yeah, at a strategic level, absolutely there should be a discussion. Then there might be a reality check of saying, well, hang on a second. This is too big a leap. We've got to build all of these different venues. Well, the IOC will turn around and say, well, hang on, not so fast. You know, only build a venue if there is a real legacy need. We don't want you building any white elephants. So build if there's legacy. Otherwise, guess what? Make it temporary. And the IOC is becoming harder and harder on countries and governments to say, we will only agree if you have a strong legacy plan. Otherwise, make the venue temporary. Does that answer some of your question? Yes, of course. But can I ask uh, one more question to you? Uh, how do you think? Is the Olympic Games are more about business or more about cultural development? Because looking at the history of places where where Olympics Games was, it's mostly uh, countries that all know about them. Like I never knew, uh, I never saw that who will do Olympic Games in Mongolia, for example. No well, one knows. Uh, let's, I mean, well, first of all, you know, the Olympic Games is about sport, of not course. about culture or business. Secondly, you've got to have a practical reality check that you do need certain infrastructure. You need to be able to look after 20,000 journalists and the broadcast. You need to be able to host 10,000 athletes. And so Ulaanbaatar is never going to have the capital infrastructure necessary to do it. But you, know, you go to Seoul, Korea, nobody knew anything about Korea beforehand. And 
they, they used the games to modernize the city and they had you know the necessary facilities so if i would look at uh, and what i know about kazakhstan you know there is no question that you could stage the winter games in almaty no question you know, you have the mountains you have you know the the perspective and the infrastructure do you want to could you stage the summer games in astana um Probably, pro probably, but you would first of all want to have a proper audit of okay, what would it require from the sporting facilities? What would I still have to build? And then you take a judgment. Does this make sense on my ten-year plan for you know the city? And the country but then you might turn around and say well actually the olympics is too big but you know what formula one or one of the football tournaments you know is very feasible of course michael but i have uh one one more question relating to to the, to the question of uh adina omarawa uh, because in my eyes, it's quite good question for uh, if we are talking about the future. Uh, okay, if it, if you talk about the time, uh, maybe uh, twenty years ago, uh, twenty five years ago, uh, it was good because the Olympic Games was maybe the main point uh, of the sports in 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 in, in uh, four years. But now <clears throat> there are some other so there are now so many events over the world even. Even Red Bull, uh, to which you brought us uh, nine years ago, they have their own games. Uh, and uh, there are so many other uh, exciting events in the world uh, that, in my eyes, Olympic Games uh, just lost its attractiveness uh, like it was maybe uh, 20 years ago. Now, is it really worse to stage the Olympic Games uh, and to, to prepare the whole country uh, in the seven years mood? Uh, then to stage, for example, other events like Formula One, like uh, Eurovision, or something like that. What is your opinion? Well, there's no question that today there are a lot more events happening than there were 20 or 30 years ago. There's no question that everybody with their phones and their multi-channel TV have got the ability to watch a lot more. But when the Olympic Games take place, they still by far have the greatest audience, the greatest engagement. And there has been no decline in the following of the games and the way that people connect. If anything, it has increased. But you have... Um, you know, people are moving around very quickly. They're jumping from following one thing to another. And it's possible that if you want in the roadmap of going to the games, in the past, there was maybe much more noise counting down than there is today, just because of the competition of all the other events. But I would argue that for some of the other events, they have lost a lot of prestige. The World Athletics Championships used to be a major event. Then they made it every two years and they lost some of what made it special. Then they made it uh, you know, the, the sport of athletics to say is struggling. So to be honest, quite a lot of the Olympic sports outside of the Olympic Games are not doing as well as they used to. Be careful when you talk about Red Bull or you know, some of these other newer events. There is a lot of marketing behind them. There's a lot of buzz behind them, but not actually a lot of people following it. The, the, the real audience numbers and everything are not 
what you would imagine. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense maybe, yeah. Who has uh, some other questions? Just put your questions here because we have uh, eight minutes uh, left. Азамат? Не слышно тебя, Азамат. Микрофон. Yeah, Азамат. Yeah. Микрофон. Микрофон, Азамат. Микрофон. I think we had you working before. Uh, he he would like to clarify some technical issue with his computer, I think, and then he 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 would ask. Uh, <clears throat> just uh, again to uh, uh, just uh, to develop this question which I raised before. There are some sports which. Uh, don't don't really need to be the Olympic Games. <clears throat> I'm talking about MMA, for example. Uh, amateur amateur MMA, the amateur federation uh, is seeking uh, is looking to to come to Olympic Games. But the the biggest organization in the world, you see, Ultimate Fighting Championship, it's the it's huge by by its own. It's now nine billion US dollar worth and producing a high level uh, quality show uh, every week, every week. And uh, they don't need really to to get this sport into the Olympic Games. Well, and uh, I, I don't. Why do the NFL, the biggest sports franchise in the world, why were they desperate to get on to the Olympic program for Los Angeles with tag football? They they, they did everything they could. Purely, and the, the issue is in order to develop their global position. Basketball exploded on the world stage with the NBA after the Barcelona games and the Dream Team. Yeah. Basketball took off after 92. Tennis, after they went on the Olympic program in Seoul as a demonstration sport, then you know, tennis was nowhere in China. Nowhere. Mm. After the Olympic program, it suddenly became very important and had the government support in many other countries. Golf is the same reason. So, you know, maybe for on the case of MMA and UFC, I think it would be very difficult to get on the Olympic program uh, because of the ex the sort of the, the protection of the existing. Uh, fighting sports, you know, taekwondo, judo, wrestling. Um, but there's no question that if they could get on, it would be transformative on their international stage. This is a good point. So I, I agree. Uh, Azamat? Um, yes, yes, Aydar. Can you listen to me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You. Uh -huh, okay. Um Mr. Michael, thank you for your uh, your prof your um, very useful performance for um, uh, our people, and also thank you for uh, Aidar for invite invite me. Uh, I have a little question. Um, I'm sorry for my English language. It's a little bit maybe with more mistake. With <laughs> um, it's, it's fine. Okay. Um, in in this time, um, um, how how can we make the Olympic Games more attractive uh, for for the um, spectators to the spectators? Don't you think that the interest among viewers ha has dropped recently against against the backdrop of popularization of MMA and maybe used uh, you? Um, UFC and maybe cyber sport. So maybe uh, MMA uh, can MMA or maybe um, UFC and maybe cy cyber sport uh, to how can I say to introdu in introduction to Olympic uh, 
program in the future? Well, um, firstly, I think if you look at most countries, the overall Olympic audience is not going down. It's, it's still increasing. What might be going down is the actual television audience because people no longer just follow the Olympics on television. They follow them on their, you know, on their mobile phone and all of that. And they follow them in the, in the, sort of in the big screens, in the pubs, in community environments. And the data and research that the tracking companies like Nielsen provide frankly, are not doing a good job at getting the complete audience environment. They're still just looking at one section of TV. Whereas if you look at the complete audience environment and how people are consuming their perspective and content, the, the, the audiences, and I mean, I look at them in, in China and uh, uh, you know, in Africa and other countries, it is all going up you raise an interesting question about uh well esport i think as we were referring and there is no there's no question esport is exploding and the ioc is looking at what is the role of esport and its relationship if you want to traditional or classical sport to what extent is there a way that um Esport is a platform to also then practicing the sport, or is everybody going to stay sitting on their sofa or behind their computer screen? And I think that's still work in progress about the whole relationship between esport, virtual sport, competing together, uh, both live and virtually. And I think in a, in a decade's time, you know, we will see a very different situation. Um, it's important that the sports program of the IOC continues to evolve. Just because something is popular today doesn't mean it's going to be popular tomorrow. If you, it was interesting to look at the new sports that were put on the program, uh, one of them is cricket, where... To be honest, the one part of the world where the Olympics has not been nearly as strong as it should be is India, Pakistan, that sort of Southeast Asian block. The addition of cricket will be transformative. Currently, India is paying about $10 million TV rights fee. Cricket on the program, they will pay $200 million. Um, yeah. MMA, um, you need to, it needs to, they need to take us a step back and say, right, one, do I want to be on the Olympic program? If I do, why? What could I contribute to the Olympic program? And to then begin a you know campaign if they decide. To, you know, recently, I mean, the IOC President Bach has introduced a lot more flexibility into the program to allow for sports to come and go and for the host country to have more influence as to some of the sports they would adopt for their own country. So if you were hosting the Olympic Games, and I'm sure with the history of MMA in Kazakhstan and IDAR's role, I'm sure that you would then be putting forward MMA as one of your preferred sports uh, on, you know, on the program in exactly the same way as 60 years ago, the Japanese insisted that judo was put on the program. And the trade-off for Tokyo 2020, when the IOC wanted some youth sports like climbing and skateboarding, the Japanese said, okay, but we want karate. Yep. 
Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Some other question from the students. I dar možda da se prošli. Da, da. Uh, hello, I would like to ask the question. So, after the Olympics, for example, after a successful Olympics at a particular country, do you, for how long do you maybe follow the, some metrics as far as development and marketing in sports in that country to maybe analyze and evaluate the you know, success of the particular Olympic Games in order to apply these results and metrics to um, in the process of choosing the next destination for the for one of the you know next Olympics. I like I'm sure you do it, but are there maybe key metrics or key factors that you know um, let's say transfer from one Olympics to the next to the next uh, in order to come up with a successful plan to have the most um, you know, effective Olympics when it comes to marketing revenue and, uh, you know, making the sport popular and all those other outcomes. Thank you so much. Okay. I mean, that, that's a, a great question. Um, and the, the, the challenge is that each country, when they are hosting the games, may have different strategic objectives as to what is important to them. But there's no question the IOC is very focused at now trying to track what is the real benefit and story of hosting the games. Yeah. If you look at Barcelona in 1992, those games are still referred to as a poster child for the transformation of the city. And the Barcelona authorities use the hosting of the games as a catalyst to completely redevelop the transport, the hospitality. Here was a city on the Mediterranean that had no access to the Mediterranean, and they transformed all of that. London, in some ways, did the same with East London, the old Docklands, which they had talked about re-renovating for 50 years, but never did it. And so they suddenly had the Olympics, and that was the catalyst. So from a technical standpoint, you've got two examples there. London, though, also wanted to be an inspiration for youth and to get more young people uh, engaged in sport. Uh, and I think, frankly, the report card there towards the government was weak. They talked a lot. And at the same time, then started closing sports fields around the country. So it was completely hypocritical. You know, Australia 2000, they wanted to um, boost tourism. And, and they succeeded very successfully with it. China, most recently with the Winter Games in 22, said they wanted to use the Games as a catalyst to introduce 300 million people to winter sport. And I think they're probably on track. Um, so each country's got to decide, you know, is it capital? Is it a sporting legacy? Is it the image of the nation that they want to change? Or it's probably a combination of all three, four elements. And to understand what works and also, you know, what didn't. Greece, Athens staged a great games. They used the games for the transformation of the city in terms of transport, airport, hospitality. But they didn't have a proper plan for the management of the sporting venues. And they built a few venues that they should never have built. They should have made it temporary. But you know, one politician or another wanted to have his personal benefit. And so they built a baseball stadium. What is a baseball stadium needed in Greece for? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, legacy is important, but legacy can be intangible. It can you know, feel good. The straight pride. You know, Britain at the moment is completely screwed up politically. Completely. And you speak 
to people living there and they look back and said the last time we were all together the last time there was pride in the country pride in the people was the 2012 olympic games what's happened to the political journey since good point excuse me Thank can you. i ask a, a, a follow-up question real quick i'm sorry yeah, for sure. if, if, I can, if i can um so for example international committee uh when you uh meet the demands of the hosting country for example when it comes to their goals of development uh goals that you mentioned that can be uh possibly asked uh, from the hosting country so is there like um, some sort of level of i would say guarantee from our national committee, for example, if I'm a, for example, I represent Kazakhstan and I ask, you know, you guys have tremendous experience and can you uh, to some degree guarantee development of a particular sport with all your um, instruments and methods and experience? For example, we know that one of the particular sports need development, needs development and uh, we will assist you, but is there some sort of guide, for example, that you will probably be able to provide the minimum level of development if they follow, if they listen, if they provide all the resources, mm -hmm. because you got <laughs> such a tremendous experience, because it, it really depends on the country with, uh, with uh, people that, you know, their demand on particular sport with their interest and infrastructure, well, of course. So is well, there like still some cases where you can at least be like, okay, guys, we can guarantee this minimum of uh, development of this particular sport with all the resources and experience that we've got so far. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the, the IOC clearly has tremendous amount of expertise, tremendous amount of insight in terms of best practice, tremendous amount of case studies. In terms of sports development, you know, they have the access with their Olympic solidarity program that is looking to help the national Olympic committees around the world, you know, on sports development. And they will, you know, bring together if you're wanting, you know, to develop judo, they will say, right, what is the best judo? Who are the best coaches? What is the best training process and program? So on the sports development, yeah, they're able to share best practice if you go back to beijing 22 let's be honest the chinese had very limited experience on winter sports competition and the ioc bought all of that experience with the federations to china um you talk about the operating side of the games again you look at the, so the best practice and increasingly on key areas the broadcasting, the technology, it's now run by the IOC. They will no longer take the risk of leaving it to the host country. Uh, but it's got to be a partnership. You know, at the end of the day, government and private enterprise and the host country, you know, is key. It's like one, only one hand clapping. You need both in order to succeed. Um, but to, to your point, the starting point is sitting down and saying, right, what does the country want to achieve and the reason the ioc has introduced what they called a dialogue phrase to actually begin talking with governments is sometimes the governments don't know and so they go in and they're able now to have a private quiet discussion and say well what's possible how does this work does that make sense if we want to do and achieve this who else should we be you know, comparing ourselves to? How, do, how does this all come together? Whereas before, the IOC would just say, if you want the games, come and bid. Now it's evolved in terms of a much more, I think, constructive discussion between you know, the parties. And uh, you know, the only problem occasionally is we used to joke there are, two phases of organizing the Olympic Games. There is the yes, 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 which is when the country is bidding for the Games. And then amazingly, two seconds after the country has been awarded the Games, 
it moves straight to the no, 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 no. And the organizers think they know how to do it, even if they've never done it. They are not going to be told how to do it, even if they have no experience. And it takes a particular mindset and leadership to actually say, hang on, this is a partnership. And to get the best out of it, we need to be partners together. But, you know, in particular, politicians, yeah, they're, they're not always great fans at sharing control. Thank you so much. I can just conclude that you probably know some countries better than uh, the politicians from around the world because <laughs> we actually deal with the government and people that are making decisions. You probably know more about countries than other politicians. Thank you. Thank you, Renat, for a very interesting question. Somebody else to ask? So, if not, uh, so let me uh, say thank you, Michael, for the huge lecture today. It's always a big pleasure uh, hearing you, listening to you, and uh, exchanging. Uh, then you are exchanging with your huge experience with us, and uh, I think all all the students, all my partners and friends uh, today really enjoyed the today's lecture. And uh, thank you so much. Huge thanks well, from from my side. Thank you very much, uh, Ida. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I hope all of your, your friends, students, colleagues uh, enjoyed uh, the insights uh, and good luck with your continued journey in the world of sport, the world of the business of sport and PR and sport. Have fun. Thank you very much, Mike. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye.